Interior art, also known as Hiberna Saxon art, is the style of art produced in the post-Roman history of the British Isles. The term derives from insula, the Latin term for island. In this period, Great Britain and Ireland shared a largely common style different from that of the rest of Europe. Art to historians usually group insular art as part of the migration period art movement as well as early medieval Western art and it is the combination of these two traditions that give the style its special character. Most insular art originates from the Irish monasticism of Celtic Christianity, or metalwork for the secular elite, and the period begins around 600 AD with the combining of Celtic styles and Anglo-Saxon styles. In particular the interlaced decoration as found at Sutton Hoo, in East Anglia, applied to decorating new types of objects mostly copied from the Mediterranean world, above all the codex or book. The finest period of the style was brought to an end by the disruption to monastic centers and aristocratic life of the Viking raids which began in the late 8th century. These are presumed to have interrupted work on the Book of Kells and no later gospel books are as heavily or finely illuminated as the masterpieces of the 8th century. In England the style merged into Anglo-Saxon art around 900, whilst in Ireland the style continued until the 12th century, when it merged into Romanesque art. Ireland, Scotland and the Kingdom of Northumbria in northern England are the most important centres. But examples were found also in southern England, Wales and in continental Europe, especially Gaul, in centres founded by the Hiberna Scottish Mission and Anglo-Saxon missions. The influence of insular art affected all subsequent European medieval art, especially in the decorative elements of Romanesque and Gothic manuscripts. Surviving examples of insular art are mainly illuminated manuscripts, metalwork and carvings in stone, especially stone crosses. Surfaces are highly decorated with intricate patterning, with no attempt to give an impression of depth, volume or recession. The best examples include the Book of Kells, Lindisfarne Gospels, Book of Durrow, brooches such as the Tara brooch and the Ruthwell Cross. Carpet pages are a characteristic feature of insular manuscripts, although historiated initials, canon tables and figurative miniatures, especially evangelist portraits, are also common. Use of the term The term was derived from its use for insular script, first cited by the OED in 1908, and is also used for the group of insular Celtic languages by linguists initially used mainly to describe the style of decoration of illuminated manuscripts, which are certainly the most numerous type of major surviving objects using the style. It is now used more widely across all the arts. It has the advantage of recognizing the unity of styles across the British Isles while avoiding the use of that term, sensitive in modern Ireland and also circumventing arguments about the origins of the style and the place of creation of specific works, which were often fierce in the 20th century. Some sources distinguish between a wider period between the 5th and 11th centuries, from the departure of the Romans to the beginnings of the Romanesque style, and a more specific phase from the 6th to 9th centuries between the conversion to Christianity and the Viking settlements. C.R. Dodwell, on the other hand, says that in Ireland, the insular style continued almost unchallenged until the Anglo-Norman invasion of 1170. Indeed examples of it occur even as late as the 13th and 14th centuries. Insular decoration the insular style is most famous for its highly dense, intricate and imaginative decoration, which takes elements from several earlier styles. From late Celtic art, sometimes known as the ultimate Latin style, come the love of spirals, triscales, circles and other geometric motifs. 
These were combined with animal forms probably mainly deriving from the Germanic version of the general Eurasian animal style, though also from Celtic art where heads terminating scrolls work omen. Interlace was used by both these traditions, as well as Roman art and other possible influences such as Coptic art and its use was taken to new levels in insular art, where it was combined with the other elements already mentioned. There is no attempt to represent depth in manuscript painting, with all the emphasis on a brilliantly patterned surface. In early works the human figure was shown in the same geometric fashion as animal figures but reflections of a classical figure style spread as the period went on, probably mostly from the southern Anglo-Saxon regions, though northern areas also had direct contacts with the continent. The origins of the overall format of the carpet page have often been related to Roman floor mosaics, Coptic carpets and manuscript paintings, without general agreement being reached among scholars. Background Unlike contemporary Byzantine art, and that of most major periods, insular art does not come from a society where common stylistic influences were spread across a great number of types of object in art, applied art and decorative art. Across all the islands society was effectively entirely rural, buildings were rudimentary, and the architecture has no insular style. Although related objects in many more perishable media certainly existed and have not survived, it is clear that both religious and secular insular patrons expected individual objects of dazzling virtuosity that were all the more dazzling because of the lack of visual sophistication in the world in which they were seen. Especially in Ireland, the clerical and secular elites were often very closely linked, some Irish abbacies being held for generations among a small kin group. Ireland was divided into very small kingdoms, almost too many for historians to keep track of, whilst in Britain there was a smaller number of much larger kingdoms. Both the Celtic and Anglo-Saxon elites had long traditions of metalwork of the finest quality, much of it used for the personal adornment of the elite. The insular style arises from the meeting of their two styles, Celtic and Germanic animal style, in a Christian context, and with some awareness of late antique style, especially in their application to the book, which was a new type of object for both traditions, as well as to metalwork. The role of the Kingdom of Northumbria in the formation of the new style appears to have been pivotal. The northernmost Anglo-Saxon kingdom continued to expand into areas with Celtic populations, but often leaving those populations largely intact in areas such as Dalriata, Elmet and the Kingdom of Strathclyde. The Irish monastery at Iona was established by St. Columba in 563 when Iona was part of a Dalriata that included territory in both Ireland and modern Scotland. Although the first conversion of a Northumbrian king, that of Edwin in 627, was effected by clergy from the Gregorian mission to Kent, it was the Celtic Christianity of Iona that was initially more influential in Northumbria, founding Lindisfarne on the eastern coast as a satellite in 635. However Northumbria remained in direct contact with Rome and other important monastic centers were founded by Wilfred and Benedict Biscop who looked to Rome, and at the Synod of Whitby it was the Roman practices that were upheld while the Iona contingent walked out not adopting the Roman Easter dating until 715. Insular metalwork. Christianity discouraged the burial of grave goods so that, at least from the Anglo-Saxons, we have a larger number of pre-Christian survivals than those from later periods. The majority of examples that survive from the Christian period have been found in archaeological contexts that suggest they were rapidly hidden, lost or abandoned. There are a few exceptions, notably portable shrines for books or relics, several of which have been continuously owned, mostly by churches on the continent, though the Moni Musk reliquary has always been in Scotland. In general it is clear that most survivals are only by chance.
and that we have only fragments of some types of object, in particular the largest and least portable. The highest quality survivals are either secular jewelry, the largest and most elaborate pieces probably for male wearers, or tableware or altarware in what were apparently very similar styles. Some pieces cannot be confidently assigned between altar and royal dining table. It seems possible, even likely, that the finest church pieces were made by secular workshops, often attached to a royal household, though other pieces were made by monastic workshops. The evidence suggests that Irish metal workers produced most of the best pieces, however the finds from the royal burial at Sutton who, from the far east of England and at the beginning of the period, are as fine in design and workmanship as any Irish pieces. There are a number of large brooches, including several of comparable quality to the Tara brooch. Almost all of these are in the National Museum of Ireland, the British Museum, the National Museum of Scotland, or local museums in the islands. Each of their designs is wholly individual in detail, and the workmanship is varied in technique and superb in quality. Many elements of the designs can be directly related to elements used in manuscripts. Almost all of the many techniques known in metalwork can be found in insular work. Surviving stones used in decoration are semi-precious ones, with amber and rock crystal among the commonest, and some garnets. Colored glass, enamel and millefiori glass, probably imported, are also used. The Ardar chalice and the Derina flanhord of chalice, Peyton with stand, strainer, and basin are the most outstanding pieces of church metalware to survive. These pieces are thought to come from the 8th or 9th century, but most dating of metalwork is uncertain, and comes largely from comparison with manuscripts. Only fragments remain from what were probably large pieces of church furniture, probably with metalwork on wooden frameworks, such as shrines, crosses and other items. The Cross of Kong is a 12th century Irish processional cross and reliquary that shows insular decoration, possibly added in a deliberately revivalist spirit. The gilt bronze Athlone crucifixion plaque is much the best known of a group of nine recorded Irish metal plaques with crucifixions and is comparable in style to figures on many high crosses, it may well have come from a book cover. The fittings of a major abbey church in the insular period remain hard to imagine. One thing that does seem clear is that the most fully decorated manuscripts were treated as decorative objects for display rather than as books for study. The most fully decorated of all, the Book of Kells, has several mistakes left uncorrected. The text headings necessary to make the canon tables usable have not been added, and when it was stolen in 1006 for its cover in precious metals, it was taken from the sacristy, not the library. The book was recovered, but not the cover, as also happened with the Book of Lindisfarne. None of the major insular manuscripts have preserved their elaborate jeweled metal covers. But we know from documentary evidence that these were as spectacular as the few remaining continental examples. The reused metal back cover of the Lindau Gospels was made in southern Germany in the late 8th or early 9th century, under heavy insular influence and is perhaps the best indication as to the appearance of the original covers of the great insular manuscripts. Although one golden garnet piece from the Anglo-Saxon Staffordshire hoard, found in 2009, may be the corner of a book cover. The Lindau design is dominated by a cross, but the whole surface of the cover is decorated, with interlace panels between the arms of the cross.